Hi, ladies and gentlemen, Terry Martin with the Illinois Channel. We're joined by Jeff Berkowitz from Public Affairs TV in Chicago. And Jeff, we're going to be talking about, we thought the legislature was done, but now they're going to be coming back next week for a major piece of legislation. It's the energy bill being pushed by the environmental groups. And they're wanting, among other things, to close down two coal-fired plants uh, to... I guess it would be said, lessen Illinois' carbon footprint. And they're looking at doing that. I believe it's 3045, or 2035, I should say. That the 2035. Hard, the hard, hard thing is uh, trying to get a hold of this legislation and really see it. Now, what's also interesting, and the public, you should know, that there are a bipartisan group of lawmakers opposed to this. These two coal fire plants to be closed down would be in central and a bit southern Illinois. You got the Prairie uh, State uh, plant down in, uh, in the Highland area and the uh, City Water Light and Power here in the city of Springfield. Let's listen to what the, uh, the mayor of Springfield said and I'm going to warn you here, folks, this is cut up a little bit just because the mayor went off on a couple of side tangents, but uh, where he's expressing his thoughts on this bill and why it's bad. China, India, they can pollute to their heart's content. We are making drastic changes in, across America. We've done that. It will be catastrophic. They need to look at what happened to Texas and what happened to other communities. You need to have a reliable, sustainable source of affordable electricity into the future. We need to be sustainable. We need to be self-reliable. And to do that, you have to have a proper blend of energy resources. So that was uh, Mayor Langfelder of Springfield. And Jeff, one of the things that uh, we should have the people know is that the critics of the bill, including the mayor and, and a number of uh, Democratic lawmakers, said that this would cost union power plant jobs, it would create much higher home electrical bills, cost Illinois businesses millions of dollars more, undermine the reliability of the electric grid, and require importing electricity, some say, from coal-fired plants from out of state. So they are wondering just what is the deal that they are pushing this for? since it is going to be so much, uh, doing so much possible damage to the state's economy. Here from 2016 is a pie chart of the electrical use of Illinois, uh, the, uh, where it's being generated, I should say. And we should point out that Illinois is the number one state in the nation for the use of nuclear power. And you see that in uh, yellow up there. Uh, also, then we come to coal. This is what they want to cut out, but notice that's almost 32%. And again, this is, a, I have to say, 2016. I couldn't find a more updated version of this. But still, a significant amount of energy from coal. And then you have another 9% plus of natural gas. So, you know, these are two fossil fuels there, the natural gas and coal. And if you want to be going to alternative energies, which is a euphemism for wind and solar, notice that wind here was about 5.7%. Solar doesn't even basically appear on the map. So, Jeff, what we're, what we're looking at here is a, uh, in some would say, an impossibility. And one of the things that uh, I'm questioning here is with so many people in the, the general population have never even heard of this bill, haven't had a chance to hear what it's about, um, and had any kind of attending town hall meetings on what it would do, what it would cost them. I would point out that Australia did something similar to this, and the result was that the electric bills down in Australia went sky high, and a number of retirees were so hard pressed as far as the high electrical cost. Uh, 60 Minutes down there did a story on this. They were uh, cooking one day a week and then eating just leftovers because the cost of electricity was so high. And folks, the thing that you 
we should point out that when we are talking about the American form of government, of uh, uh, lifestyle, I should say, the American lifestyle, being a sumptuous lifestyle, the reason that has always been true here where it has not been true in other countries is because we have low priced electricity compared to many other countries. And Jeff, Illinois uh, has low priced electricity, which the people in the business community are saying is one of their their competitive edges. And by passing this bill, it would drive up costs. Wind and solar are higher cost uh, than the fossil fuel sources of producing electricity. And so we're going to be not only driving up the cost for consumers in their homes, but we would be driving it up for uh, Illinois businesses. And that also could cost jobs. Bringing everybody back next Tuesday and Wednesday, we're taping this on, on June 9th and they're planning to have everybody come back next week, June 15 and 16, the Senate and the House on separate days, taking alternates, one passing then the other, and doing it that way. I, I don't know why everybody thinks there's been a change. There hasn't been. Speaker Mike Madigan's spirit lives. We're continuing to do things in an ass backwards way, excuse my language, but I mean, the, the orderly way would be to have discussion, have analysis, march out the data, if all is good, show us. Well, we ought to have a, a discussion of how costly this is going to be and what are the consequences and, course, and why this bums rush to do something like this that's going to impact everyone. And folks, here's something else. Uh, I have a book here written about Chicago heat wave, and uh, it, it comes up. It, it covers the 1995 heat wave that came over and impacted so much of Chicago. And it says right here that in 1995, Chicagoans suffered through a blistering week-long heat wave that buckled streets and downed portions of the city's power grid. It also left over 700 people dead. And Jeff, I can assure you that the vast majority of those who died from the heat were not people in Winnetka with air conditioning. They were people on the west and south side of Chicago who were living without air conditioning or felt they couldn't afford to run their air conditioner. And when you do something to the electric power sources that drives up the cost, you are going to be mean, uh, raising the number of people who won't be able to afford to run electricity, just as we saw in Australia. And when you have a heat wave like this, I mean, this isn't just some esoteric exercise. This involves life and death in many instances, as we saw in Chicago with 700 people dying. If uh, Illinois cur currently gets 30% of, of its electricity from coal, as we phase out coal, how much of that is coming from Illinois coal uh, entities? And if it is all, where are we getting the other from? Coming from other states at what cost? Uh, are the different cons. Same thing with nuclear. Nuclear can't go on forever. We're currently getting 50%, but these plants are not set to continue in perpetuity. Are we phasing out all? We're certainly phasing out some. Folks uh, on the Democratic side of the aisle, I know you have a green lobby, but you also have unions working for you, and you're going to be putting union job jobs you're going to be closing down union jobs now i think they're going to be saying well we're not doing it tomorrow we're going to be doing it in 15 years or so but um and and you get some kind of a variation we hear on these plants but you know uh, rather than having a commitment folks we don't have the technology to take these plants offline and jeff but just before we leave this topic let me just remind people that here we are uh with look how much in pink there the coal and the, the light blue which is natural gas uh you know you've got close to like 30 or 42 43 percent uh how are you going to replace that you, you you're going to replace it with energy sources that are not base load power energy sources that are intermittent so jeff uh, what what some came up we just had uh the governor when we left they had the, uh, the bill passed to redistrict pol politics, political redistricting. The governor said he was going to take a look at it, but lo and behold, he just signed the bill. And let's take a listen to what uh, 
rather harsh comments from Jim Durkin, what he had to say about it. Even though yesterday he told reporters he was undecided and hadn't reviewed the maps. Governor Pritzker, you sold out. You sold out independents. You sold out Republicans. You sold out Democrats to the, the partisan Democrat machine, which has destroyed Illinois. And Governor, not only did you sell out, but you lied. Uh, this just happened uh, moments ago as we are taping this on Wednesday. Uh, the House Republicans, uh, Senator McConkey, the leader of the Republicans in the Senate, and Jim Durkin, of the leader in the House, filed a lawsuit. The lawsuit argues that the use of the American Community Survey estimates violates federal law, including well-established one-person, one-vote principles under the Constitution. More than 50 good government and community advocacy groups and leaders implored the General Assembly to wait for the release of the official census counts, which are expected by August 16, 2021. I mean, after all, folks, this is why we're redrawing the maps after 10 years, because of the 10-year census. And then they're not even going by the census data. They said they had to do it by uh, June. I think that is a deadline that could have been kicked down the road a bit. June, no, June 30, the constitutional deadline, Terry, they didn't want to risk losing complete control of redistricting that they had with the super majorities the Democrats have in the House and the Senate and the governor's chair. They want to risk that. So that's the reason why they had to hot risk violating the Constitution by using non-census data. That, that's the hook that caught the Republicans into federal court. We'll see if they can stay there. Uh, because you need to have that hook if a possibly a civil rights violation, violation of protected class, minorities, blacks, Hispanics, they will say none of this happened, even though they're not using census data, they're using a substitute for it. We'll see. We'll see. They're now in federal court, and that'll be going on for quite some time. The Republican candidates running for governor and, and now have 13 months, and they might start talking about some important topics like Illinois shrinking as neighbors all around gain population. I think we have some slides, Terry, that would show that. And that's something that's important for the governor's race. And now they got over a year to talk about that. The population, those are, that's the key to your economic growth. And this is from the census data. And it shows over the last 10 years, Illinois in term uh, is losing population to neighbors of 18,000. And they probably lost more because I think this data, these might be offset since it's census data. It includes perhaps birth over deaths growing. It includes foreign migration, I believe inter international immigration coming in. So this is offset somewhat by that. Uh, some of these, and we'll see that, we'll see more details as we've got the slides coming up that shows of the actual losses of population in terms of net out migration from Illinois to our other neighbors. But on that chart, we, all of our neighbors are gaining population. Iowa, Missouri, Kentucky, Michigan, Wisconsin, uh, Indiana, and only Illinois losing. And here we go, we've got Illinois is the third biggest loser as a percent of population from, now, from net out migration in 2019. So this is put up by wire points, the wire points data, so same with the first slide. Okay, the third biggest loser. And it shows our neighbors, they're losing some population and percentage, but way down. Minus six, minus 0.61 for Illinois. Those people leaving, Jeff, as you well know, are leaving with their income. So this is costing the state big time. Yeah, look at the people that red curve you see there, that red line, the people who are leaving, what's their average income in, 20, in 2019? This is a path of over the last nine years, but 2019, those folks are taking with them their taxable income of $91,000, uh, more than $91,000, and the people coming in are bringing with them $71,000. So the average loss person coming in, $20,000. And you can see that gap between the red and the blue lines, that's growing over time. It's getting worse, okay? 
So not only is losing population, we're losing taxable income. That is a source of providing for government services. So those of you who want to have government doing certain things, and there is whatever you want, small government, you're going to have to have some government. You have less to pay for that. Illinois is the biggest loser. Is the biggest loser is Illinois as a percent of adjusted gross income. It lost six billion dollars. You can see that in terms of percentage terms, minus 1.4 percent. Uh, the, our neighbors losing less, Iowa, Michigan, Missouri, Indiana, Kentucky, Wisconsin, all less. Florida is the big winner. It's got $18 billion of additional income. It's the best. Well, it's the second, second best, but close. It says 49. That means 49 means uh, very furthest, almost furthest from the worst. And at 49, they picked up almost $18 billion. We lost $6 billion. Those charts, those data that come analysis comes to you via WirePoints, who looked at the IRS data, which came out recently on that. Um, and so I think uh, the main thing is the governor candidates should be talking about that stuff. It's key. You don't want to be losing population. They are talking about that somewhere. You don't want to be losing adjusted gross income. And we have some polling data we can look at to say, what we probably know, Illinois is on the wrong track and has been on the wrong track for a long time. If you do this right track, wrong track data, with that, there's a recent poll by Ogden Fry done in early June, and all means that's all of the people, Democrats, Republicans, and Independents, who responded to the poll. And um, only 39% of Illinois says when you look at everybody you say we're on the right track 61 percent say we're on the wrong track okay but if you look at you see a lot of that comes from democrats who are saying we're on the right track 69 percent of the democrats say right track 31 percent say wrong track look at republicans it's 10 to 90. independents 35 to 65. so republicans and independents are overwhelmingly saying we're on the wrong track and it's only Democrats seem to have a lot of confidence we're on the right track. Now, if we go back and look at the, these are approval ratings on the bottom part of that chart. If you can go back, Terry, go back, don't go back. Bottom part of the chart, we can see all overall, Pritzker, that's approval of J.B. Pritzker's job rating, getting 58%, disapproved 42%. But again, that's coming mostly from Democrats who are 91 to 9 in favor. Republicans 24 to 76 against or disapproving, and independents 48 approve, 52% disapprove. So I think part of what my, my interpretation of it, and that's Ogden Fry's poll. We saw that data in Rich, Rich Miller's Capital Facts. We've modified not the data, but the analysis to make it a little bit easier, perhaps. Major problems not being addressed, still on the wrong track. Some people may say it's a little bit better than maybe when before JB came in, but still not good. Whether it's the electric bill, whether it's the you know the right uh, heading in the right direction, we've talked over the last months of the legislature. You got the pension, you got the schools closing, you also got uh, other things going on in the schools. And the question that comes up to is with the gubernatorial election coming up next year, uh, you know, are the Republican candidates? going to be taking advantage of some of these issues uh, that I think are hot button issues and, uh, and you know, can ring some bells and really cause a problem for, for the governor if they actually can articulate that. Well, maybe we should whet the appetite to our viewers and tell, our next, tell them next week we're going to get into some of those important new social issues which the governor's, Governor Kenny should be talking about and the governor should be talking about. What are the new social issues? Well, what are we doing in our schools? Were they closed needlessly for the last year? What might happen next year if COVID should come back? So keeping the schools open, that's an important new social issue. Are we teaching sex education, perhaps at inappropriate ages? And what do people think about that? What are the ages at which it's appropriate to talk about with our grade schoolers, oral sex, anal sex? Turns out we have some polling data. Well, and, and, and surprising, we didn't think, I mean, it's not you and I, Jeff, bringing this up. This came up in the floor debate 
uh, which uh, Representative Lilly had a bill, SB 818, uh, which was talking about the standards for teaching sex ed in schools. Republican Representative Tony McCombie uh, took some exception to that. Let's listen to a bite from that debate. Actually, defining sexual intercourse for your 10-year-olds as having sex, in quotes, that can involve the penis and the vagina or the mouth and the genitals for your 10-year-old or the penis and the anus for your 10-year-old. Unusual kind of debate that we heard there. And, and I think, you know, how many people, again, uh, one of the themes that comes up in Illinois a lot, Jeff, is that the legislature, the government, is doing things that they're not kind of really bringing the people up to speed on. And then they pass these standards, whether it's changing the electrical grid standard and what energy we're having, whether it's changing the standards for sex education in the schools, uh, whether it's drawing the political maps. And then all of a sudden people go, wait a minute, how did this happen? And again, uh, it, it kind of draws uh, into question how this democracy in Illinois is working and whether that by itself is going to be an issue and to what extent is Governor Pritzker and his heavily democratic legislature uh, being transparent with the people and being up front. As our state legislator Tony Bacomi was saying there, she's questioning as to whether it's appropriate as to the kinds of sex education we're doing, especially in our lower grades. Um, and I think we have some polling data that we might be able to take a look at, again from Ogden Fry, on is Illinois um, the first state uh, to adapt its uh, new, to the new sexual education standard to comply with some national education, sex education standards. And apparently, I don't know if we're doing this now or we will require all third to fifth graders in sex education to be taught about masturbation. And you see the polling data, it's again a sharp split between Democrats, Republicans, and independents. If you look at the polling uh, for all of the people, the support is only 34% for doing that, teaching that stuff at those grade levels about masturbation. Support 34%, opposed 66%. But you look at the Democrats, 58 to 42, 58 in favor of doing that, 42 against, Republicans, 7% favor, 93 against, independents, crucial independent swing votes, 30% favor that, 70% against it. Again, we're talking third to fifth grade, what is that, 10 to 11 year olds? Uh, I mean, it's just, I don't, I mean, we, we want to teach things at appropriate levels. Is that the appropriate age? Is that what the third and fourth, fifth graders should be doing? Are we teaching reading properly? I mean, the next thing if we talk about, if we have time, is there's an issue about hormone blockers to delay puberty for children who are contemplating a sex change operation. And we have some polling data if we can put that up. So, so what that chart shows, what this slide shows is uh, when they're going to get into the issue that is teachers and sex education about using hormone blockers to delay the onset of, to delay the onset of puberty for those children who are considering uh, having a sex change operation. And it shows only 26% of the people overall support that. 73% oppose that. But it's Democrats who are actually 50-50 in favor or opposed, and it's Republicans and independents who dramatically oppose that being discussed with third and fifth, third, fourth, and fifth graders. And independents, the same, dramatically oppose that. This is a social issue. This is a matter of what you teach in your schools, who should decide what's being taught, the local school board, the state, should it be mandated? These are important issues now to be talk, talking about at the state level. These are social issues. I'd call these the new social issues we're facing. People want to be involved in their you know, children's uh, education. Jeff, we're going to have to get out, but you know, in, in the broad scheme of things, as I've already said, this is there's so many issues that I, I think we just don't hear enough. 
And some of it is the problem with the governor, some with the lawmakers, uh, some with, you know, a lot of times the Republicans pounded the table and did a good job on saying we need to have fair maps. Uh, they didn't get some of these other issues out. I heard very little about anything about the electric grid and, and changes and what that would impact that would have on consumers, on businesses, on people, again, talk about leaving the state. Hey, once we double or triple their electric bill, you think people are gonna maybe wanna leave Illinois for cheaper places? I think so. So in a larger context, you know, are the people of Illinois being served properly by the way Illinois continues to conduct business? And I uh, obviously, as you had gone over with all those stats, a lot of people are voting with their feet, they say no, and they're saying a pox on your house, and they're just kind of throwing up their hands with government in Illinois. And one wonders if we need to make changes, when are the changes going to come? Because they don't seem, as Jim Durkin said, uh, this is uh, what what they're doing with the, the redistricting, he said, was just uh, right out of Mike Madigan's playbook. And that Speaker Welch, instead of being a breath of fresh air, is just following the same game plan as Mike Madigan, according to Jim Durkin. And Terry, there are rumblings that new entrants might be coming into the field running in the GOP primary. We mentioned that we have three current candidates in the GOP Republican primary that's set for June 28th, 2022. Gary Rabine, Paul Schimpf, Darren Bailey, and some are thinking perhaps we need more diversity, whether it's gender diversity, racial diversity, ideological diversity. You mean in the Republican actually. Party or in general? No, in the, in the primary. Maybe we need more choices. Right now we have three sort of middle-aged white guys. That's fine. Well, for governor. But do we, need we don't know who the candidates are going to be for some of the other offices. Uh, Oh, yeah, I'm just talking state. about the governor's race. I'm just talking about the governor's race. Mm -hmm. That's obviously an important race. But in a sense, Terry, we've started the general election, even though we haven't completed the primary yet, because Governor Pritzker said recently, well, he doesn't know if he's running again. There's a heavy burden on the family, on not seeing his wife and his kids. And I, I take that as word, but I think he, most people I think... I mean, yeah, it's not a given that he's going to be... It's not, notwithstanding that, excuse me, notwithstanding that, having spent... 150 million dollars in 20 years in preparation if they think he's running if he wasn't running and we don't know if he is or isn't but if he isn't running uh there's a whole lot of republicans would like to know that now and because they've moved the primary back for democrats and republicans uh governor pritzker can you know hold his cards to his vest and not really let us know for a number of months longer than he ordinarily would have I know he transferred some funds recently into his campaign coffers, but that doesn't mean uh, that he's going to run. He could just use those funds and make donations to other Democratic Jerry, candidates. He's running. You can take that to the bank and collect interest. Okay, <laughs> I'm predicting Governor Pritzker's running, even though he said what he said. Uh, and we got three candidates in. There may be others coming in anyway, even if Governor Pritzker is running, because some Republicans think this is a very winnable year. There are a lot of problems with COVID, COVID management. Illinois has a lot of economic problems. For well, let me throw something else out. Liabilities, et cetera. Uh, a lot of Democrats, a lot of, a lot of Americans uh, would be surprised if Joe Biden ran for re-election given that, you know, his age. So, I mean, let's just to be provocative, let me say, maybe Governor Pritzker would not seek re-election so he could run for president. And that way he could be on the campaign for a couple of years instead of being burdened by running the state of Illinois. <laughs> just something to consider, folks. But Jeff, we got to get out. We're going long. And so folks- You heard it first. That's a, that's a prediction or that's just a possibility? It's just a pop. I'm just being provocative. All right. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for watching. Give us a thumbs up if you like. Uh, leave us your comments. And uh, we'll read them. And Jeff, we'll see you next week. Thanks.